Good afternoon, everyone, maybe morning in your part of the country. Uh, and welcome to N4A's DE&I, Moving the Chains for a Better Future. Um, we are going to take care of a little bit of housekeeping right here at the beginning. If you don't mind muting uh, your video and, um, excuse me, muting your sound and turning off your video for all intensive purposes right now. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the very end. And so we'll be using the raise your hand uh, feature. Um, we hope that you've been enjoying uh, the 2021 uh, NACTA and Affiliates virtual convention thus far. I am Shanika Munjan. I'm currently serving as the Associate Director for Student Athlete Academic Services at Florida State University. Um, I get to serve as the N4A Division Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So I get to help some great committees. Well, I get to help you, um, work um, with our board and just make sure we're critically looking at policies and practices across the field. So in this session, we're gonna have some real talk uh, about strategies relevant to uh, the recruitment, the acquisition, um, the uh, retainment of diverse athletics personnel. Um, we're joined by some amazing uh, industry leaders who will explore the importance of diversifying talent pools, of, of mentoring staff um, and students uh, and getting students into the employment pipeline and just creating an inclusive place where folks want to work. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Mr. Kelly Brooks, if you would. Thanks, Shanika. I, I look forward to being here. Thanks for the opportunity. I see a lot of old friends um, and it's great. Just excited to see individuals in here. I'm Kelly Brooks. I currently work for Renaissance Search and Consulting, which is a search firm that focuses on diversity in the hiring process and the creation of a candidate pool. I've worked in college athletics and higher education for almost 30 years now. I got my start coaching basketball at the Division II level and then at the University of Alabama on the basketball side. And I got out of that coaching world, thank goodness, and transitioned to administration. I was in academic support um, in Alabama. Then I oversaw the academic support area at Xavier University um, for a couple of years. I've been an associate commissioner at a conference office. Uh, I spent eight years at the NCAA headquarters and I oversaw the legislative relief process. And, and, and essentially that's the world that the, the, the new NIL has, has, uh, has grown out of. Uh, and it's crazy to think, you know, over 15 years ago, I was sitting at the table and we were discussing Jeremy Bloom and, uh, and here we are. Uh, way too late, but we did get there to some of the decisions. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, Jade, if you don't mind going next and, and telling us a little bit about yourself. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm super happy to be in this space with you all today. Um, my name is Jade Hines Clark. I use she, her pronouns. I'm actually very fresh in my career. Um, I went to uh, the University of Richmond, played basketball for four years, um, graduated in May 2020. Um, and then I went over to VCU, our crosstown rival. I still get a little bit of heat for that. Um, but I went to VCU um, to, to finish my master's. Um, in sport leadership at their, at their Center for Sport Leadership. Um, and now I'm back at the University of Richmond um, as the coordinator of student athlete leadership development and engagement. Uh, so really happy to be in this space with you all. As I mentioned, I'm fresh in my career, so hopefully I can bring some of that perspective today, um, but happy to be here with the other panelists as well. Great. Um, thanks. So hello, everyone. My name is Dee Dee Merritt. I uh, happily serve as the Director of Leadership Development for the NCAA. Um, my career in athletics started uh, many, many moons ago. I won't tell you how many moons, uh, but it was many moons ago um, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, which is also my hometown. Um, I had uh, several roles um, within athletics uh, as well as on campus. 
um, before uh, I was able to transition over to the NCAA, um, where I started in leadership development as an associate director, uh, and then was elevated into the director position um, a little over two years ago. Uh, happy to be here with all of you. Uh, looking forward to learning um, and engaging with you all on such a big, important topic. Thank you. I think that's me after Dee Dee. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Good morning on the West Coast. Brian Russell, Senior Associate AD for Sport Administration and Student Athlete Development at uh, the University of Illinois. Uh, I serve as our sport administrator for six of our sports, men's basketball, baseball, soccer, men's women's golf, women's gymnastics, uh, and also have the privilege of uh, leading our student athlete development unit headed by Liz Reyes. So thrilled to be here uh, representing the M4A and our student athlete development and uh, academic services group in this NACTA panel. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Dee Dee, uh, Kelly, Jay, Brian. Uh, we know that diversity of thought and diversity of experience uh, makes institutions, organizations, and departments better, right? And that they're producing well thought out initiatives uh, that speak to and serve all of our stakeholders. So we had the vision to have this important conversation about moving the change through our hiring practices. And I mean, there's no better way to do it than to have all of you here with us. So we're gonna jump right on in. Uh, I wanted to pose a question to the group as what do you guys see as an emerging trend in the space of recruiting and hiring uh, diverse candidates? And anybody can jump on in. I'll jump on, I'll jump on in. Uh, working for a, a search firm, something that is, is new, is transitioning that old adage of, you know, everybody knows, hey, if you're an AD, you've got a list in your desk of, of five coaches for each sport that you could potentially need to, to hire when a coach moves on. Well, a, a newer trend is creating a list in your desk on the administrative side, um, which is essentially pipelining future candidates. So working on hiring before you actually have to make a hire is, getting to know people out there in the, in the workforce, um, whether they are marketing professionals, external uh, fundraising, student athlete development, but looking at those different departments in your athletic department and really looking out to see who do I know that can connect me to the individuals, the up and coming talent people in this area and just start getting to know people and creating relationships and creating chemistry None, Nonetheless, you have that opportunity to just be ready before there's a time. If you've got a great staff and you got talented people, you know that they're going to move on. So having that list of people that are out there uh, is helpful on the administrative side as it has been uh, really tremendous from, from a coaching perspective. And that's something that we've been helping institutions do at Renaissance. I'll go next. Um, I think another uh, trend um, that I've seen uh, in the uh, recruitment space uh, is individuals, institutions, organizations casting a wider net. Um, recruiting used to be pretty homogenous. You would uh, have individuals who would ask um, individuals that they know in their circle. Uh, and therefore, a lot of times you received, uh, those individuals received lists of people um, that were the same. People are being more intentional and direct about asking for diverse candidate referrals for positions. Uh, it's more targeted recruitment and it's that intentionality that um, I'm seeing in this space right now um, that is really um, heartening uh, in, a, in a very, very uh, positive way uh, because people are directly asking, um, who do you know um, that is, is a diverse candidate uh, that would be a good fit for that uh, position? So it's really being um, diverse uh, and intentional, I would say, uh, is a trend that I'm seeing right now. I can jump in here next. Um, so I think networking has always been important, but I believe the concept of, you know, relationship building specifically is on the rise. Um, as a young professional going through programming like the NCAA Emerging Leader Seminar and several um, other programmings, I think there's an emphasis on building relationships with folks who are in roles that you're interested in. Um, so not networking to maybe get that job, but really building those relationships to understand what, you know, what folks in these roles are doing um, to see if that's something that is a fit for you. And I think that's something that 
I really love to see from this industry is just how willing, um, you know, seasoned professionals are um, to share kind of their expertise and share, you know, what it is they do on a day to day to make sure that, you know, it's something that you feel passionate about um, before kind of jumping into it. Before I, I jump in to uh, share my thoughts on the emerging trend, I encourage you to use the chat. Uh, certainly, if things that uh, panelists say, um, if those are things that you agree with, jump in there. If you have questions along the way, um, ask them now, even if we get to them later in the Q&A. Uh, it'd be good to have an active chat going uh, where you're dropping your gems and uh, hashtags and retweets, everything, even if it stays here in the chat. Uh, so specifically on, uh, on an emerging trend, I'm going to take a little bit of a different spin. Uh, and I say this... Uh, currently serving as a chair of a search that we're attempting to wrap up here for a senior associate AD for the DEI space uh, and sport administration. And so specifically, uh, a trend that I've seen emerging in the DEI space is, is candidly a growing number of black and brown folks have expressed concerns about being wary of jobs that typecast them specifically into being the DE and I person, uh, and, and especially when they're out there on an island. So uh, I think a trend that we're seeing, and, and uh, it's good that people are going to be able to be choosy because we're seeing more positions pop up. Uh, but I think there's there's a real concern from some rising stars that they're worried about their mobility in and out of that role and into other areas of administration. And so the challenge really is to leaders to to really put a lot of thought into searches and put a lot of thought into that, that reality of the trend uh, to to think strategically about how that person is not on an island uh, and how they are providing thoughts in a leadership type capacity, but also what other spaces they're going to be involved in in that role. Thank you. Um, you know, I heard the words uh, strategic and intentionality just kind of across the board in everybody's answer. So I wanted to pose this question and maybe Kelly or Dee, you could pick this up. Um, just kind of what are some ways in which you evaluate uh, candidate hiring documents? How are we looking at cover letters and resumes and their experiences? How are we measuring those experiences as we're trying to pull a diverse uh, candidate pool? Dee Dee, you go first this time. Great, thanks Kelly. Um, so I looked at this question, Shanika, and I thought that, you know, it, it's, I'm going to put a different spin on it. I think that um, you have to look at the documents and try and find a story about that person. Um, resumes can only take you so far. Uh, I would argue maybe paying more attention to the, the cover letter, to look at the cover letter and see what story does that tell. Um, one of the things that we've done with our new um, electronic platform, the Leadership Collective, um, is allow our ethnic minority um, profile users the opportunity to tell their story um, by answering a series of six questions, but it gives them the opportunity to talk about themselves as well as their leadership and their leadership philosophy, um, their beliefs on student athlete development, um, so that people get the opportunity to find out more about them outside of just what is listed on their resume. Um, because resumes can only tell you so much about a person. Uh, and so it's really about maybe paying a little bit more attention if you don't have um, that sort of capability to be able to answer questions um, in a profile such as the Leadership Collective. I would say it's probably looking at it and, saying, and paying more attention to the cover letters to see what story is being told in there. How are their uh, experiences being um, expounded on? Where, where do you see that hidden enthusiasm line um, in for this position? Um, because the, the resumes, I mean, at the end of the day, there's all different sorts of formats, but a resume can only take you so far. Dee Dee is right. Like, is your resume telling the story of, is, it, is the Kelly Brooks resume uh, a list of data on Kelly or is it telling Kelly's story? And you can look at your resume and you can figure that out. Is it data or is it telling, telling your story? We've done a disservice in college athletics, in, in my opinion, when it comes to hiring um, because we have not done enough to look at and look for tangible skills of candidates that transfer over to the job. And I... I feel like the, the success in many ways of my career has been, there have been a couple opportunities that I've gotten roles that my resume did not specifically point towards that opportunity, but someone looked at my experiences in the environments that I came from and looked at the tangible skills 
that was bringing to the table that met the needs that they were, were looking for. So when I'm looking at resumes or re responses to questions or, or cover letters, I'm really trying to pull back the layers of, hey, this person does look like they bring some things to the table, although they may not be your traditional assistant AD for marketing candidate or your development candidate. What are some things that they, that they bring to the table that makes you feel like, hey, this needs to be a conversation with this person? And you may be wrong. You, know, you may get to the conversation, you don't see those things, but you find a way to look for those other things, filling back the layers to see, hey, what's their story? What are the tangible things that they bring to the table to help you decide if you want to have that conversation? And then when you have that conversation, then many times you'll be pleasantly surprised to see, gosh darn it, they, they are a perfect fit for this opportunity, although they don't look like that traditional standard resume that points to them in a certain direction in the athletic department or in a conference office or at the NCAA national office based on the experience in their resume. Thank you. So we, we, we pull back the layers. We kind of, we have this, this candidate on campus. And so maybe uh, Jade or Brian, if you guys don't mind speaking to what initiatives maybe that you guys have in place on your campus um, to improve the department culture, to be more welcoming um, of diverse individuals and kind of what are you doing? Go ahead, Jade. <laughs> yes, I can take this one. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I think, you know, as Didi mentioned before, just being really intentional. I think, you know, we've all had the nerves of a first day. We've all maybe had nerves when, you know, going into competition. So I think about, you know, how is it that I would feel and what would I have appreciated? So I think um, when we talk about, um, you know, different initiatives, like just being intentional about what you want new hires to feel. Do you want, what, what sense do you want them to get out of their um, first day or the interactions that they have with you? And so really being intentional about, you know, walking them around um, is something that I've seen at, at our department, what we really prioritize. If, if you're in your first kind of week, we're going to take you around, make sure you see everyone in different offices on campus. Um, and being that we've got some new developments and new spaces, we really want to make sure that we, we let our new hires know what's available to them, where these folks are, um, if they need help, where they can find them. So I think really making sure that, you know, it's not just, you know, you look at the staff directory and you're one there, that people actually know who you are and what you're doing. But on the other side to that, they know, um, you know, where they can find you and what resources you can provide for them when they need them. Those are, those are great points. And, and really this, um, you know, building on that, this is a mindset that starts from the top. The, the leader has to absolutely sing the organization's core values. They got to sing them loudly and proudly and make it known what the department stands for. And, and uh, truthfully, it's something that we try to simplify at Illinois. Uh, we've got a four word mission statement, unify, develop, inspire, achieve. So simple. If you know those four words and you're living your core actions, your daily actions back to those core values, that's what we're building every day centered around those four words and so that really then permeates the culture that you're trying to create and what matters to others as they are as they're integrating into your culture and uh and uh definitely building that culture together so in terms of uh in terms of a real initiative though um a foundation to really something that we do at illinois is our diversity and inclusion committee certainly there are a lot of folks that have uh dni type committees but uh, it's one that we're incredibly proud of here it's a, it's a group of about 30 deep uh, and what I've learned in talking to uh, those that don't look like me, that that piece, that committee was a big selling point where it was a place where they felt like they could be seen and heard um, on a weekly, bi-weekly basis in that committee meeting. And so um, that diversity and inclusion committee uh, is critical to help create the culture to make sure folks with different identities feel welcome. And, and realistically, though, I mean, we have these committees, but we've got to move past the performative of these committees and, and, and how do you get into true of lasting action as you're creating that culture. And, and so one of the things that we've done here uh, just last week, uh, candidly, we just, uh, we held an all athletics department staff, a two day retreat uh, from everybody from our third shift employees to our head football and basketball coaches. Everybody was together 300 strong in the floor of our state farm center. Uh, and the purpose of the, of the two day retreat was to reset the mindset and expectation of, of what we're trying to build. Um, and, and really it's, it's based on the foundation of trust. And so when you think about it, um, so we brought in Stephen Covey, 
Uh, he is the uh, author of a, of a book called Speed of Trust, amongst uh, others. Uh, but we brought him in and really we focused the opening session on talking about um, the speed of trust and the critical importance of creating an environment where trust is not earned. A lot of people, you know, they, they talk about, well, you got to earn trust. We got to start by giving trust and, until we're proven otherwise, because when you create that trusting environment, that's the foundation for people to feel welcome and to feel motivated and people to be able to feel like they are seen and heard. And so one point that stuck uh, stuck with me there was something that Covey said, where he said, differences are strengths only when the environment is built on trust. And, and I think that's important and critical in the DEI space, because you can't just add folks with different backgrounds, different identities without a culture to sustain it. Otherwise, they're going to show up and realize that they don't fit in and they're gone. Uh, and realistically, if there are, are folks leaving uh, and there are folks leaving college athletics at a high rate, we've got to look at it and figure out well, what are we not creating well in a culture together? Uh, to make sure and, and that, they, that they have an environment where they can thrive. And so uh, I think that's something that a very specific initiative that we took on. Um, I mean, think about that. How many athletic departments across the country uh, would just shut down for, for two, uh, nearly two full days, uh, pull coaches off the road for recruiting? And what it does is it goes back to my main point that starts at the top. And so when the, when the leader of the entire unit says, this is critical, this is important, here's the culture we're going to create and here's how and why we're going to do it. Uh, I think that's a real initiative that um, that you can look at and be proud of. Thank you, Brian. Those were some excellent points. Thank you both to Jade uh, and Brian. Brian, I, you know, I'm hearing you say starting at the top um, and really utilizing. I love what you said about what you guys are doing in Illinois with the the DEI committee and and having it not be so performative. So moving kind of to a, another type of committee. Uh, and, and this question, it will pose it for uh, Kelly and Dee Dee. Um, what do you believe uh, institutions and hiring managers or hiring committees, their rationale should be when they're selecting folks to serve on the hiring committee? What are they looking for in terms of the experience, the professional outlook? How many is too many when you are uh, putting together a group of people that will select uh, a candidate? Ellie, take it away. I'll take a shot at it. Um, so we, we've got to get back to and continue to use this filter of we're doing this for student athletes and we're doing this for, for students, right? So we get caught up in, this, in the diversity of, you know, look and feel, but keep in mind the diversity of, of thought and perspective when you're putting together a, a hiring committee um, because your student athletes come, you know, not just from a diversity of look and feel, but a diversity of thought and locations throughout the country and cultures throughout the country. Um, so that's one thing, continue to keep that student athlete, that student filter. Many times we're putting together these committees as well. We're always using individuals that are going to interact with the person that, that we're hiring, which is great, right? You want those individuals' opinions and recommendations and how they see the individual um, but, but what, what, we've, what I've seen here more recently in, in, in working with Renaissance and, and we've helped to source candidates and pools for positions throughout the athletic department from your starter positions of assistant, whatever, assistant director of marketing all the way up through the hierarchy is bringing in individuals that will likely not have any regular interaction with this, with this candidate from other parts of campus whether they are someone that is truly student-centered, essentially they're not student-athlete-centered, but they're student-centered with what they do on campus or individuals that are across campus that are student, student support or academic support. But what are those areas of, hey, we need to make sure we keep students at the front of mind when we're doing this. And when you bring in these individuals, that don't have any usual general interaction with the candidate during the regular job, they are tend, they tend not gonna have any bias towards what this person is gonna be doing or how they need to be doing it, things like that, because they're not gonna really work with this person on a daily basis when they're hiring. So they're gonna be really candid about what they're seeing and what they're hearing um, and what they're viewing when they're looking at information or, or communicating or, or listening to questions being asked and answered. Um, so definitely keep in mind of bringing in individuals from across campus that will not have regular interaction with this person. So they're not really caught up into how much they like the person 
or how the person's going to treat them when they're working with them every day. They're just caught up in the, is this a good candidate or not? Is this a good fit for our university culture, not just an athletic person? So that's one thing that I use as a tip when you're putting together those hiring committees, then look at those, those couple of facets. I don't have an opinion of there being too many people involved. You know, you want individuals to have their impact. Um, I think people, when they have an opportunity to provide recommendations, they feel like that they have say so in what's going on in the department. They're, they're, they feel like they're trusted, right? Talk about you, you, you trust them to be a part of this process. So there's no such thing as having too many individuals involved to make a recommendation, but keep in mind, it's gonna be a recommendation, right? There's someone that's at the lead of making a decision with hiring this individual. I would add that I think that there needs to be an intentionality on the inclusion part of the process to take it a step further from the great advice um, that Kelly shared in being intentional about diversifying the different levels in the hiring process. The hiring process on campus a lot of times is very um, homogenous and hierarchical. It's the coaches, it's the administrators, it's the support staff, um, and those groups are together. My recommendation would be to make sure that you're getting those diverse viewpoints at all levels, mix it up, mix up those levels and make sure that different voices are being heard. Don't separate and stratify them. Allow people to be in the same room together so that those senior level administrators are hearing from someone who is in the, on, in the support staff role in real time and not reading feedback that the person might have uh, provided uh, via a, a report written at the end of the day, but that if those groups are diverse, if we are intentional in being inclusive in that process and not just asking people to be involved, but having them be involved with other groups outside of their own, I think that that could have the potential to bring a whole nother layer um, of important insight into what is a, a very important process. Thank you both. I I, I love what what both of you have said. Uh, and Dee Dee, I'm I, I'm hearing you, and we've been doing a lot of hiring here lately, and. Um, I learned so much during the interview process from uh, my peers and about how they're experiencing the culture uh, at our university. Uh, so I, I love the hiring process because you're, you're getting fresh perspective from folks you work with and, and, and folks, folks on the outside. So I, I think you're spot on with that, uh, getting rid of that stratification. Uh, Brian, I wanted to ask you, uh, and, and not to uh, just fo focus all the attention on you, but wanted to ask you and anybody else who wanted to, to chime in on how do you uh, concentrate on championing uh, diversity at those times when there's, there's little, uh, at least in look and feel, uh, little to no diversity in the room? How do you champion it? Yeah, Shanika, I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's real. I am uh, the heterosexual white male uh, of this panel uh, and come to it from a, a place of privilege where I, I have a seat at the table and I'm in the room. And uh, I reached out to a colleague as I was preparing for, uh, for this question specifically. And I said, you know, how would you answer this? How do you think that I uh, champion uh, when there's little to no diversity in, in rooms? And, and uh, that person said, uh, you use your privilege to empower in spaces that will help pe position people to do their best. And then you push them to do better than that. And that really, it struck a chord to think about using privilege to empower. And I think that's what we have to do. Um, when uh, So really three kind of prongs to this, three thoughts to this. First and foremost, uh, it's about being vocal. Uh, when you're afforded a seat at the table, you have an obligation to use that opportunity and that privilege to look around and see who isn't at the table. Is there gender diversity represented? Is there ethnic and racial diversity represented? Is there diversity and sexual orientation represented? Is our leadership group at whatever level, whether it's a, a unit head or whether it's a senior staff or an executive, executive staff, does that leadership group reflect the faces and identities of the young people wearing our uniforms? Because if it doesn't, then we need to look around and ask why, why it doesn't. And, and what are the barriers that have created the makeup of the room? And so you have to be unapologetically critical when you enter search processes and, and be intentional into the networking and recruitment process, even if it isn't your direct area. 
at the leadership level, you are the shareholder of the department. And regardless if it's an area that it's it's really it's on you to provide appropriate and uh, and honest thoughts on on how to diversify the the leadership of that unit. Uh, secondly, I, I think it's um, it's critical that we're intentional about understanding viewpoints and issues that that others are facing. Uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, uh, as a white heterosexual male, uh, I'm not going to understand the reality of all the lenses uh, and experiences of people that are looking up to me. Uh, and, and realistically, though, my cultural competency can be improved by talking with others and by and by being direct about it. Uh, so I think about last summer in the wake of George Floyd's murder and and what we, how we activated as a DNI group and as a as a committee. And uh, I'm in the room and have an opinion that's heard. And so it was important to me that I reached out quickly to our staff to see how they were doing, what was needed. Uh, so it was important to be able to advocate quickly and then candidly take a back seat and, and allow, uh, allow others to talk and allow others to share viewpoints and, and allow others to have a light shined on them uh, as we work through what's needed to support staff in that, in that, uh, in that moment. And, and candidly, it's, actually, it's, a, it's a skill uh, building that cultural competency and, and understanding how to use that privilege is a skill to develop and it, and it takes work and it, it's comfortable and it's easy to not dig in. But if you're privileged enough to be in the room, then you need to understand what people that are that are not in the room really need for change. Uh, and, then, and then finally, uh, you know, last comment on this one of how to be an, an advocate and how to champion diversity when others aren't there is that it's, it's not enough just to hire folks with different identities. Um, that's great to hire folks with different identities. But uh, what I've said for, uh, for quite a few years now is that it's about hiring them into leadership roles and, and giving them seats at whatever table it is that, that you have the ability to put them at. Uh, and realistically, you heard, uh, you heard Kelly, you heard Didi talk about it, but putting folks with different identities and leadership roles is the way you develop the pipeline into new leadership roles when they become available. Uh, I think too often uh, staffs take a look around like, well, we don't have anybody at the next level that, um, that, that can just move up and be ready for that. Well, it's because you haven't developed them well. And so you need to start that pipeline early and how you do that based on uh, the soft skills that Dee and Kelly talked about early, that, that's, that's when you take chances. You take chances at the entry level um, on soft skills because then you can train and build and mentor and get them right. It's, it, it's difficult to do when you've seen success in the industry based on your own path. Uh, and so it takes extended work to be aggressive about deepening a pool and creating connections uh, with folks that aren't like you. But if you're if you're about that action and you want to truly create the change, uh, then that's the work you have to put in to be able to build that credibility for the staff uh, each and every time you go out and search. Thank you. Some powerful uh, uh, tools that you gave us. Uh, Brian, um, I want to talk for a second and maybe steer us a, a little bit about uh, the new ADID uh, distinction uh, about this chief uh, diversity officer uh, role. Uh, and Brian or, or Jade, if you guys want to jump in and talk a little bit about what is this person's role or what do you see uh, as this person's role in your campus as well as your department's hiring process? Yeah, thank you for this question. I think, you know, and with new um, roles that we're creating, I think um, Brian mentioned this a little bit before um, about, you know, the br brown and black folks um, really being pushed into some of these roles. And I think, you know, what we really have to be intentional about is regardless of who your um, chief diversity officer is, the work is not solely on them to carry out all the DEI initiatives, make sure everything's running the way it should be. I think that's a team effort. So really making sure everyone understands what, what their role is, but also how they help this person um, in that. Because I think, you know, as a black LGBTQ woman, I feel like personally, I take a lot of, um, um, a lot of the burden sometimes to make sure all of these things are running well and make sure we have all of these programs and initiatives. And, you know, I really have kind of had to sit and, and think with myself that it's not all on me based on my different identities. And I think when you have allies who can support you in the work that you're doing and hold your hand and walk through that process with you, it makes it feel even better. Um, so I think just really being intentional about making sure we empower um, our chief diversity officers to 
work within their capacity, but also, you know, not be afraid to reach out for support. Um, and in my role, working with our marginalized and, and special populations on campus, I think that's been something that I've really been intentional about is making sure that, you know, coach, administ coaches, administrators know what it is I'm doing and how they can help me in that work um, to make sure that, you know, it's not just all on me, it's not on all on our um, chief diversity officer. So, yeah, I really just think, you know, making sure that you're asking questions to that person, whoever's in that role, about how how you see yourself elevating their work and how you can support them. I would also say that I, I, I think that it's also about making sure that that person has a seat at the table uh, when the decisions are being made, because yeah. you can have diversity and not have inclusion. Um, I'll say that again. You can have diversity and not have inclusion. You can have uh, a diverse staff and your entire senior leadership team be uh, majority. And so it's really important that now that we, we have these roles and we're understanding the importance of diversity and inclusion in our, in our space and how it not only supports uh, each other as colleagues, but more importantly, um, helps to provide our student athletes with a more well-rounded and holistic experience for them to be able to see themselves and those who coach, teach, and lead them. Those people need to be at the table when discussions are being had, when decisions are being made. Um, they can't be marginalized. You can't bring them in and then, and then they're off in the corner and they're not being in the room when important conversations are being had about future direction um, initiatives that, that are at a higher level. Um, and they have to be supported. The work that they do, um, it has to be supported. It has to be supported by leadership 100%. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Brian, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, anything to that. Uh, can I just say retweet uh, DD and then uh, move on? But yes. uh, no, that was great. Said a lot of a uh, lot of powerful words there that uh, that uh, I would agree with completely. Okay, so very now, well. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Jump in on what Jade was mentioning. I just want to reinforce. You know, as Jade talked about, one of the things that I've had a chance to learn and grow from um, more recently is so here at Renaissance we do corporate searches as well. So I've had a chance to learn that world more than because I, I don't know that world, haven't worked in that world since I've been in, since I've, I've worked in higher education. Um, they, the ones that do it well, they see that role, chief diversity officer, as a project manager. And that person is given the authority as a project manager and not someone that's, that's supposed to do all these things. They are supposed to lead the project of other areas doing all these things and act as a hub. Um, so when Jane mentioned the need for that person to have the support and essentially be the hub of what everybody else is doing is very important. And if you look at your athletic department and that person is not given that authority or treated that way, then you're not taking advantage of the role as it should be. Because if this person, that, at that point, the person is just doing, doing a job to solve problems, but they're not the project manager for the area or the department to, as a whole, solve those problems. And, and those are, uh, so I mentioned this at the beginning, uh, and those are great points, Kelly, that uh, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, I'm wrapping up chairing a, a search for a new position, a high level DEI thought leader. And, and we were very, as we looked at this uh, as an executive staff, we were very intentional about how this was structured. Uh, and candidly, that's, uh, I think we drew a lot of interest uh, and had a lot of conversations with folks based on the way it was structured. So similar to what Kelly is talking about, I think you have to be so intentional of how you structure these positions to make sure that, that um, the folks that are leaving this area um, have the ability to hold folks accountable for action items as well and have the ability to share opinions and values, but the work isn't theirs. Uh, you know, there are at, at the leadership level, when you get to the, when you get to the leadership level, um, if you aren't continually thinking about diversity and inclusion, fundraising and compliance, you're, you're missing the mark. I mean, regardless of what your role is, if you aren't thinking about those three things, whether you are the academic director, student athlete development director, the ticket manager, whatever it is, if you aren't thinking about those three things, you aren't leading to your full capacity. And so uh, putting someone in a position to be successful there is critical in the hiring process. 
Absolutely. Thank you, panelists. I do want to move, shift a little bit to some Q&A. Uh, we are a little short on time, but I do see a really uh, great question uh, in the chat uh, from Steve Thompson. He uh, asks, how can smaller schools attract a more diverse candidate pool, especially at schools in like Division uh, Two, Division Three? What are some ways that they can kind of pull in? Man, li listen, so with smaller schools, we tend to default to the old processes or just how the process has always been done. But I'm telling you, like, there's no such thing now as getting a great candidate pool when you're just going to post on NCAA.org or post on, on NACTA. Like, it's not, it's just not going to happen because people have so much more that they're attracted to inside and outside of athletics these days. And, and in the corporate world, they see bad hires as a huge loss of money. And I think the athletic departments need to look at it in the same way. When you make a bad hire, you're going to hire again, and you're going to spend money, spend money doing this. So at the small school level, what, what I've seen people talk about is going to diverse individuals on the campus and saying, really, like, why are you here? Like, why, why are you working here? Either what made it attractive and why did you stay? And has it been good? And then they give the script answer and be like, no, 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 no. Why are you here? You know, and see if you can get to that because at that point you can learn what about your small school can attract someone that's not the default candidate for, for your small school. And that's a step that needs to be taken. Um, and then the whole posting, and you, know, you gotta take advantage of your resources at small school with individuals like D.D. Mayor. You know, this is someone that knows the people that are out there that are diverse candidates that work throughout college athletics. Conversations need to be had with these people. Otherwise, you're gonna to default to the same posting and get the same kind of candidates and it's not gonna be what you're, what you're looking for if you're not tapping into the resources of, of a MOLA or a DD or other individuals that have the knowledge of the candidates out there. And once they have the knowledge and they can help promote your institution and your athletic department as a good fit for this diverse candidate because they know the candidate, they know this individual personally, and they know what this person is looking for and what's a good fit for them. And then you're going to get the candidate as a small D2 school or D3 school that it's not the default candidate pool that you've gotten before. Thank you. Did anybody else want to chime in? Okay, I know we are short on time. I feel like I feel like we need a part two of this. It's been uh, some great conversation. I want to say thank you uh, to um, all of our panelists. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with the, the NACTA uh, family today. The conversation doesn't end here. Uh, the move starts with each and every one of us, inch by inch. Uh, you know, we'll move to the end zone as we move the chains uh, with an effective game plan and with persistence. So I thank again all of our panelists. I thank each and every one of you uh, for joining us today and we hope uh, that you enjoy the rest of our virtual conference. You guys take care. <laughs>